Um, so, well, and as Bruno said, so it's been obviously my pleasure to, to have been working together with him and also with many people that are present here and uh, really a uh, highlight of, um, of my career. And I can tell many stories about how we started uh, working together when he spent uh, a week or two uh, at that time in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so I would not talk to, today about molecules. So I would like to talk about um, craft neural networks. So that's one of the topics uh, that, that I'm working on. And uh, maybe I should say that that um, I like very much the official title of my position because it gives me a unique opportunity to harass Google at every machine learning conference demanding to show me my chair. <laughs> they deep my chair. And so far, they, they only had stools available. So, so I'm still waiting for to see, to see the actual chair. And um, I would like to talk today about uh, physical uh, inspired approaches to, to learning on graphs, whatever it means. So uh, I hope. Create order, beauty, and perfection. So, of course, it was used by the Greeks to explain why music sounds well, for example. And the Greeks also believed that that uh, the, all the stuff in the universe is composed of these tiny little uh, symmetric objects, polyhedra, that we call platonic solids nowadays. Uh, and uh, because they're symmetric, because they're so perfect, then everything has to be made up of them. And that's actually, if you maybe some of you do crystallography, so that's how crystals look like, right? So it's not a completely crazy idea. And uh, this is geometric concept, and uh, the Greeks are also credited with uh, creating the modern geometry, or at least formalizing it. And this is what we, what we still teach as the geometry at school, right? Euclidean geometry goes back to more than 2,000 years to ancient Greece. And as you probably know, uh, he formulated these five axioms or postulates uh, from which all the geomet geometric theorems are derived. And uh, there was this fifth postulate about parallel lines that somehow stood out and uh, uh, many uh, famous mathematicians tried to prove it uh, uh, to, to no avail until the, the 19th century where came first the realization that you actually don't, uh, you cannot prove it so you can construct uh, self-consistent uh, uh, non-Euclidean geometries. And this created an entire zoo of different mathematical objects that, that was even not clear how they uh, interact with each other. And it created uh, quite an unhealthy situation in, in, in this field that was uh, brilliantly resolved by Felix Klein in, uh, uh, in the seventies. So he was uh, very young, I think only 23 years old when he got the appointment as professor in Bavaria at the University of Erlangen. And uh, as probably still customary today, uh, he was asked to deliver an inaugural lecture about what he is going to uh, to teach and, uh, and and study at Erlangen until his retirement. So he never gave this talk. He never stayed at Erlangen. Uh, he moved to Göttingen, but it entered in the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program. And uh, he um, proposed a very radical, uh, mm -hmm. different way to, to, to define geometry as a, a space plus a group of transformations. So you would look at an object and uh, subject it to some uh, group of transformations and see what kind of properties are preserved. So for example, Euclidean geometry comes from uh, um, the group of... relations between relations, but arguably the biggest impact was in physics and uh, also in the beginning of the 20th century came uh, the first realization that you can derive the laws of physics from fundamental, uh, from first principles. And probably the most famous result is uh, uh, Neuter's theorem, which uh, showed that you can, uh, uh, you can, uh, you can derive uh, conservation laws, like conservation of energy from, from uh, principles of symmetry. And uh, this was pretty remarkable result because uh, so far these uh, laws were mostly empirical. So you would make an experiment many times and you observe that certain quantities are preserved. And Weil himself introduced the, the notion of uh, gauge symmetry that was used in quantum mechanics and uh, uh, in certain generalized way to uh, uh, create a unification of different uh, interactions or different forces. And 
uh, what we nowadays uh, know as the standard model uh, uh, in of particle physics. And basically, you can think that uh, all physics that we know nowadays it can be derived from different groups, right? So what physicists call internal symmetries, the, the symmetries of um, of the quantum fields that give rise to different forces, and external symmetries, the symmetries of the space-time. And I think it was very laconically formulated by uh, by Philip Anderson, Nobel laureate in physics, uh, who said that it's only slightly overstating to say that physics is the study of symmetry. Now, what does it have to do with uh, machine learning? So first of all, in machine learning, we also have this kind of unhealthy zoo of different architectures that were derived historically for different types of problems, for different types of data, like convolutional neural networks derived in computer vision, uh, uh, actually coming from ideas in neuroscience, uh, recurrent neural networks that were derived for an analyzing sequences and temporal data, graph neural networks that you can argue that, that go back to problems in, in computational chemistry, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So there is apparently no relation or no um, common denominator in, this, uh, in these architectures. And what we try to do in uh, geometric deep learning, so it's this kind of uh, principled approach that, that uh, takes uh, ideas uh, that are inspired by the Erlangen program, trying to say that uh, all these architectures can be derived from uh, appropriate choice of uh, geometric domain and symmetries that are associated with them, whether it's convolutional neural networks, whether it's uh, recurrent neural networks and so on. So just to give you briefly the, the idea, uh, if you think of maybe simple setting of machine learning, uh, supervised learning, right? The, the, the canonical problem of uh, distinguishing between images of cats and dogs. So you provide this input, let's say vectorized uh, images of cats and dogs, uh, you feed them into some black box and you want to produce uh, uh, the output, uh, which is a binary label, right? So, and you can think of it maybe a little bit cynically, right? That it's a glorified function approximation or glorified curve fitting. So I have multi-dimensional input. I have a few sample points, right? So I, I have examples of images with corresponding labels, and I would like to fit a function that that, uh, uh, that represents well these data and also generalizes well. And the question is, what can we put in this black box? So the obvious candidate uh, already since the late 50s was artificial neural networks, like uh, the perceptron that was first designed by Frank Rosenblatt. That was the first learning architecture that somehow in a very simplistic way tried to imitate the, the function of the brain. And from a mathematical perspective, we know that uh, these neural networks uh, can be very generic, right? So the so-called universal approximation property, so just two layers of such neural network allow us to approximate any continuous function to any desired accuracy. Now, of course, you can ask the question, is continuous function, maybe it's too big a class of functions, so I can give you a set of finite points and I can pass crazy continuous functions through them. So I need to impose some extra stuff and uh, mathematicians have good notions of uh, what would be considered a well-behaved function. For example, Lipschitz continuous functions uh, uh, are a common class that is used in, in, in functional analysis. And the problem is that these results do not really tell you uh, how to do it, right? So it's kind of existence theorems, but they don't tell you uh, what is the number of points, what's the number of neurons, how to, to choose the parameters of this neural network. And in fact, you can show that uh, if I start growing the dimension of my input, so if I uh, have two-dimensional input and then maybe three-dimensional input and then d-dimensional input, and I ask the question, how many samples do I need to approximate uh, this well-behaved Lipschitz continuous function to accuracy epsilon, you will see that it will grow exponentially. And since in machine learning, we are dealing with problems uh, of data that lives not in thousand dimensions, maybe in millions of dimensions, then the number of samples, the number of cats and dogs uh, that I need to show to the neural network will be astronomically large, more than the number of particles in the universe. So this is obviously an intractable problem. And you can kind of see it in computer vision problems. Let's say I give you uh, uh, an image of, of digits and you can parse it into a vector and feed it into this neural network. And you see that, that um, if I just move this image by uh, by a single pixel, then the structure of the input will uh, completely change, right? And uh, what I will need to do, I will need to show a lot of examples of this uh, sh shifted or more generally transformed input uh, in order to teach the neural network that uh, uh, it should be classified in the same way, right? So that's, that's what we call data augmentation. And uh, this made uh, these kind of simplistic architectures very inefficient, so in the 80s, uh, came a new class of uh, architectures that explicitly accounted for the, for these kind of problems, incorporating uh, um, translation invariants into these architectures. First, the neocognitron of Fukushima, and then the classical CNNs, convolutional neural networks, developed by Jan Lekan. And the idea was to do local weight sharing, so uh, you automatically make the, the architecture uh, translation invariant, or more correctly, translation equivariant, 
And this way you can also show, uh, that was shown significantly later, you can deal with the problem of the curse of dimensionality. So basically this gives you a kind of generic blueprint that instead of considering your inputs as high dimensional vectors, you can consider them as signals that live on some domain. And this domain can be an image, can be anything else. And then you equip the domain with some group of transformations that can act on the signals that live on the domain through some group representation, right? So concretely in convolutional neural networks, that would be the group of translations and the, the uh, and the, the shift operator. And then uh, the functions that, that take as input these, these signals must respect this symmetry in some way. And this way is typically uh, invariance and equivariance. So convolutions actually can be derived from first principles uh, as uh, linear operations that, uh, uh, that commute with shift. So the, the, the translation equivariant. I don't know, those of you who studied signal processing, whether this is how uh, the convolution was shown. Probably not. At least when I studied it, it was kind of hand-waving and, and uh, discussion about sliding window and nothing, nothing like this. So today I would like to talk mainly about graphs. So graph neural networks are also another example where the domain is a graph and the, the, the symmetry that is associated with it is the permutation or reordering of the nodes. And uh, this is what uh, reflects the fact that in graphs we typically don't have a canonical ordering of the nodes. And again, these ideas can be applied to many different domains, uh, to graphs, to, to sets, to homogeneous spaces, to manifolds, and more or less any uh, deep learning architecture that you, you find in the practical use uh, can be derived in this way. And actually this blueprint has already produced uh, uh, generalizations of architectures that didn't exist before, like uh, equivariant graph neural networks that are nowadays very commonly used in, for example, computational chemistry. So as I said, let's talk about graphs primarily. And uh, I hope I don't need to convince you that graphs are important. So this is very common mathematical abstractions for uh, systems of relations and interactions at all scales from very tiny things like molecules. So nodes of, uh, uh, of, of graphs are atoms and edges are uh, uh, chemical bonds and very large objects like social networks where you have on a uh, planetary scale, uh, we capture relations and interactions uh, between different people. And uh, what are graph neural networks? So graph neural networks are parametric functions that take as input a graph with maybe some associated features and produce some output. And this output again can be problem dependent, but what is shown here, for example, a very typical problem that we encounter in virtual drug screening, very important application, obviously. Uh, uh, so we want to predict properties of a molecule, whether it will be toxic or whether it can be dissolved in water. And we represent the molecule as a graph, we feed it into some graph neural network and we predict the, the desired properties. Now, how this parametric function looks like, uh, there are multiple architectures, but most of them can be put uh, into one of these three categories. So the most generic one is message passing. So every node uh, collects information from the adjacent nodes, right, along the edges of the graph and uh, transform this information in some way. Now, a less general uh, particular case of this is what is called attentional architecture. So we aggregate information from the nodes uh, using weights that are computed based on the features. And the probably simplest and uh, actually architecture that was developed here by, by uh, at the PFL by, by Michael de Ferrar from, uh, he was a PhD student of, uh, of Pierre van der Gains, uh, convolutional architectures that uh, boil down to, to classical CNNs when the graph is agreed. And in this case, the aggregation is uh, independent on the features, it's dependent only on the uh, structure of the graph. Now, what we also know is that under some technical conditions, uh, basically the aggregator must be injective, uh, the message passing graph neural networks are at most as expressive as the vice fer Lehmann graph isomorphism test. So it's a classical result in graph theory, uh, named after these two gentlemen, Andre Lehmann and Boris Weisfeiler, who are actually inspired by problems in uh, chemoinformatics to try to determine whether two graphs are uh, structurally equivalent. So if there exists uh, an edge-preserving bijection between them, what we call uh, uh, isomorphic graphs. And uh, just looking at these graphs, it's not necessarily easy to say whether they're isomorphic or not, right? And let alone test them. In fact, it's the complexity of graph isomorphism is somewhere between NP-complete and, uh, and polynomial. So we actually don't know. So it's usually put, put in, uh, in a special class of complexity. But uh, these graphs are actually non-isomorphic, I can tell you, but the WL test cannot distinguish between them. And it works by color refinement, so it examines the neighborhood of every node. And in these graphs, we have neighborhoods uh, initially of uh, uh, two nodes, uh, two neighbors and three neighbors, and we can refine uh, iteratively the, the colors until the, the, the colors stop changing. So 
we produce a distribution of these colors. And uh, if the, 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 the two histograms uh, are different, then we can say for sure that uh, the graphs are non isomorphic. But uh, if they are the same, we don't know. So, in other words, it's a necessary but insufficient condition for graph isomorphism. So, bottom line of this story, this is a, a standard formalism that is used to, uh, to describe the expressive power of graph neural networks. In other words, what kind of functions they can, uh, they can compute. So this is in theory. What we have in practice, of course, as we've seen, there are some graphs that we, we cannot test by, by WL test, but also because we somehow need to implement this message passing, right? And it turns out that some graphs are not friendly for message passing. So if I need to send information from, uh, let's say, this blob to this blob, we have just one connection, right? So I will need to squeeze a lot of information and make it pass through this bridge. So there might be some computational issues, right? So what has been done in the literature, we can expand this formal hierarchy so to, to, uh, to do progressively more expressive uh, uh, versions of these WL tests. There are still some graphs or families of graphs that cannot be tested. And we can design, of course, the equivalent um, uh, versions of message passing graph neural networks that, that, that are bounded by, by the expressive power of these tests. What we do in practice is uh, we often don't stick to the same graph that is given as input in order to do message passing. So this is a class of methods that are called graph rewiring. And this breaks the link between the theory and the practice. So in practice, we want to change the graph on which we propagate information in theory. Uh, we can analyze only the situation when we stick to the input graph. And again, a lot of things have been done in the literature. So we can augment uh, the input graph with, for example, positional or structural information, substructure counts, something similar to what is used in transformers. Uh, the, the sinusoids, right? So these would be eigenfunctions of the graph Laplacian. We can take our graph and lift, uh, lift it into a uh, uh, cellular or simplicial complex. So we can do hierarchical topological message passing. We can consider a graph as a collection of subgraphs that are extracted by some policy. And there are beautiful results in graph theory that are called reconstruction conjectures. So we can uh, be strictly more powerful than WL test. We can also augment uh, the, the, our set of symmetries with the continuous symmetries of the of the data, like in case of molecules, these are geometric graphs, so they, uh, they have they can be subjected to continuous transformations such as reflections and rotations. So we can be invariant to permutations of the nodes and uh, equivariant to, to, to continuous transformations of the node features. And in special cases, if we have regular structures, then we can make the message passing more specific, sensitive to the order of the neighbors. And in this case, we get classical CNNs. Now, there is another way of looking at graph neural networks is by how much I want to, to stick to the input graph. So in the uh, one extreme case, I can say that I completely discard the graph structure. So I, I consider just the, the set of, uh, of the graph nodes, right? And basically, we can apply architectures that are special case of graph neural networks that are called deep sets or point nets. And this is common in computer graphics, for example, when analyzing uh, three-dimensional point clouds. On the other extreme, we can say that I allow to any to, to uh, any pair of nodes to interact. And in this case, I don't have a predefined graph. So the graph is complete. All the edges are possible. And I would like to learn through the attention mechanism what is the right graph for the downstream problem. And this is how transformers operate, right? So that's the, the attention mechanism. And we can, of course, do something halfway, right? So graph rewiring says that I kind of trust my graph, but maybe it's not the most efficient. So maybe I will cut some edges, I will add some edges, and so on and so forth. Now, another thing, if we look at different geometric domains on which we can do learning, I mentioned graphs, right? And grids are special cases of graphs. We can also look at meshes. So these are graphs with some extra structure. So they all, they, these are discrete manifolds. So we have nodes, edges, and triangles. If I look at the way that uh, I aggregate information from my neighbors in the, on these objects, so on grids, we don't have any ambiguity, right? I have canonical order of the neighbors. I can talk, uh, talk about a neighbor uh, that is uh, uh, at my top or at my bottom, at my right, at my left. So everything is fixed. Uh, in case of meshes, I can uh, choose one of my neighbors and then order all the rest of the neighbors uh, in some canonical order, for example, clockwise, right? Because it's locally, it's a manifold. So uh, we have um, local Euclidean structure, but the, the choice of the first neighbor is ambiguous. So everything is defined up to cyclic permutation or rotation, right? So that's actually the structure group of uh, a manifold with Riemannian metric. And in the general case of a graph, I can permute my neighbors in any way I want, right? Because again, we don't have any canonical way of doing it. So in some sense, graphs have uh, the least structure out of all these objects. And another thing that we notice is that 
I can think of grids and meshes as discretizations of continuous objects, right? A grid is a discretization of a plane and a mesh is a discretization of a surface, but uh, we don't have this immediate analogy for graphs, even though there is an entire field of network geometry, uh, we want some kind of continuous models for graph neural networks. And that's exactly what uh, I like to call physics-inspired GNNs, and uh, that would be the, the, the topic of, of, uh, of the lecture today. And uh, for the rest of, the, uh, of this talk, think of the following mental model. So we would like to think of graph neural networks as a kind of dynamic system, right? So every node in the graph is a particle in some high dimensional space, right? So the, the feature space, and it, it moves along certain trajectory that is shown here in these red lines. Now, how these trajectories evolve? Let's say we have some system of differential equations, right? So X encodes here every row, so it's a matrix, time dependent, every row de denotes the, these d-dimensional uh, coordinates in the feature space, and every row corresponds to, uh, to uh, a node of the graph, to a particle, right? And uh, there is some function that is applied to these, uh, uh, to these, uh, to these metrics, and uh, the rows interact with each other, right? So they're coupled. So this, uh, uh, this function couples the, the rows together. If I discretize this uh, system of differential equations in time, uh, let's say with some fixed uh, time step tau, I can get uh, basically a system of uh, differences, right? So the discrete solver. And I can consider the graph as a way of coupling uh, uh, these, uh, these equations, or I can also, as we'll see, consider this discretization of some continuous uh, spatial object. So what kind of differential equation we choose here? It's a good question. So there have been many works looking at, for example, uh, uh, models that, that describe propagation of waves or maybe even quantum mechanical systems. But probably the first thing that, that you, you think of when it comes to some diffusion or propagation of information, that's the, the heat diffusion equation, right? So that was studied by uh, none less than uh, Sir Isaac Newton himself. He actually published the first uh, experimental observation in a mathematical model describing how heat dissipates in, uh, in different objects. It was published anonymously in the transactions of the Royal Society in 1701. And this is what we, nowadays we call the Newton law of cooling. And it tells us that the, the uh, the, the temperature a hot body loses in given time is proportional to the temperature difference between the object and the environment. So it doesn't actually need to be heat. You can it, it, it apply the same principles to, to chemical diffusion, to even abstract things like diffusion of rumors in a social network, right? So, so the same principles apply. So this is how it will look like on a graph. Basically, what we, what we see here, let's say X, I denotes the, the temperature or any other quantity we want to diffuse. In, uh, uh, in my node in the graph, and xj will be the, the, the same quantity in my neighbor node. So what we see here is the self-temperature. Then we look at the difference of the temperature of the environment, right? So that's the average over the neighbors. And the rate of temperature change is the temporal derivative, right? So that's a differential equation that describes this process. I can rearrange the terms. I can write it like this. And what we see here is a parallel to, to classical uh, calculus, right? So we can call this the, the gradient or the graph gradient. So it looks at the difference of the features at two endpoints of an edge, right? And we basically, this, uh, this is an operator that takes us from signals that live on the nodes of the graph uh, to signals that live on the edges of the graph. And then for every uh, node, we look at the edges that emanate from this node and we collect their signals. And this is the, a joint operator that is called the divergence, right? So again, it has a one-to-one -one analogy to what you probably know from classical calculus. So together, the divergence of the gradient or minus divergence of the gradient is called the Laplacian operator. And uh, this is the basic version of heat equation, what is called homogeneous and isotropic equation, right? And Laplacian is actually a very important operator. It measures exactly this thing that uh, how different you are from your neighbors. So you find it everywhere in every uh, uh, equation of mathematical physics. Now, what we also know about heat equation that it's uh, a prototypical example of uh, what is called the gradient flow. So gradient flow, is a variational continuous version of uh, what is called uh, steepest descent, right? So uh, your uh, evolution equation looks like uh, a step in the negative direction of the gradient of some energy, right? And the, the energy that corresponds to, to, to the heat equation is what we call the Dirichlet energy. So the Dirichlet energy uh, is the norm of the gradient on uh, uh, the, the, the gradient of the graph. And it measures the smoothness of the node features, right? So the gradient uh, will be zero if my neighbors look exactly like myself, right? So if we have a constant signal on the graph, we can show that it decreases along the flow. And in the limit, when we uh, allow the diffusion to run infinitely, 
it will result in oversmoothing. So everything will be constant. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? If I assume that my graph is homophilic in the sense that all my neighbors are similar to me, then I can, uh, for example, if I know that the labels in in a few nodes and uh, I need to, to, to guess the, the labels in, in some other nodes, I can fix these as boundary conditions and just diffuse them. And under the assumption of homophily, this is a very good idea. It works very well. If the graph is heterophilic, if this assumption is not correct, then uh, this, of course, will produce bad results. And we need to do something more sophisticated that also involves learning. So back to our problem, the classical approach to, to graph neural network design, right, from this perspective of dynamic systems, would be to start with a differential equation, discretize it, right, and have uh, uh, every iteration of a solver corresponding to a layer of a graph neural network. And then you parameterize every layer of graph neural network with its own set of parameters. What I'm suggesting is to do something different, to start with an energy and parameterize the energy. And then the, you derive the evolution equation as a gradient flow. So obviously not every evolution equation is a gradient flow, so it imposes certain restrictions and limitations. What we gain is uh, what you can call better interpretability. And by interpretability, I mean that we would be able to prove mathematically that certain behaviors, for example, are impossible. So we would like to avoid certain situations uh, uh, that typically are difficult to guarantee in graph neural networks. So let me give you an example. So what is typically claimed about uh, graph neural networks of the convolutional type that they are unable to deal with heterophilic graphs, right? So here's an example of a completely heterophilic graph. So every uh, blue node has only red neighbors, right, of different types. So the, the, the color here represents the, the two labels of the nodes, right? And their, uh, their coordinates here represent some toy uh, two-dimensional feature space, right? So what we'd like to do here is to classify the, the nodes of the graph. So in other words, we want to completely separate these uh, blues and, uh, and reds, right? And you see that we can design these trajectories that completely pull them apart, right? So uh, this is how the energy will look like. So this is a generalized Dirichlet energy that we can act on every node uh, in the same way by some uh, matrix W that is called the channel mixing uh, uh, matrix. And this matrix, you can think of it in physical terminology as a combination of attractive and repulsive forces. So uh, these particles attract along positive eigenvectors of W, right? And you can see it, it's in this direction, the vertical direction, and they repel along the negative eigenvectors of W. So that would be this horizontal direction, right? And we want to have both, right? So we want to cluster similar nodes together and we want to repel uh, uh, to separate the similar nodes um, from each other. So if we write the differential equation, it looks like this. So you see that this is what we call the convolutional type of architecture, right? Why it is convolutional? Because X is our feature vector, right? So here we act, write multiplication by the channel mixing. It affects every node independently, right? So it doesn't mix information between the nodes. And the only propagation on the graph, right? So the structure of the graph is captured in this matrix that is dependent only on the structure of the graph. It's independent on the features. So I can write it as a linear equation, okay? So the learnable parameters here are these coefficients W. And what we can show that this linear graph diffusion, right, or convolutional GNN, if we appropriately design the channel mixing matrix, and specifically it has to be symmetric, so we can guarantee that this is a gradient flow. So this equation is the gradient flow of this generalized Dirichlet energy. And it also must have sufficiently large negative eigenvalues, right? So we have sufficient repulsion. So we can uh, not only over smooth everything, we also have the sharpening effect. Uh, then we can probably avoid oversmoothing. So we will not have a situation where everything collapses into the same point. So we have a constant signal on the graph, right? And we can kind of see it in the synthetic example. So here we have a graph where we can continuously control the level of homophily and we can get from a situation like this to a situation like this. So the two extreme cases here would be to completely disregard the structure of the graph and say that we do classification at every node individually with an MLP, multi-layer perceptron, or we can say that we use uh, the, the, the GCN architecture, right? So the, the kind of architecture that was actually developed here. Uh, and you see that uh, MLP, of course, independent on the level of homophily because it ignores the graph, it achieves some level of performance, but it's, uh, it doesn't take advantage of the redundancy and similarity of the neighbors uh, when the graph is homophilic. GCN works almost 100% accuracy when the graph is homophilic, but it deteriorates uh, drastically when uh, the graph is heterophilic. And it's uh, because it averages uh, unrelated things, right? So it uh, puts together apples and oranges. And again, the typical uh, motivation to, to, to these claims, the, these folkloristic claims, why GCNs or convolutional architectures more broadly are unfit for heterophilic graphs, because this matrix averages your neighbors, right? So it's a low-pass filter. 
and low pass filter, if it averages to get unrelated things, then, then it can make these assets. But you see that this theorem essentially tells you that the story is much more nuanced and more complicated because we have two matrices that interact. So we have the, 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 the mixing matrix uh, on the right and we have the propagation matrix on the left. And by uh, using this gradient flow framework, we can uh, benefit from both worlds. So we have automatically graceful degradation to the performance of node-wise uh, 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 classification when the graph becomes uh, becomes heterophilic. Now, the assumption of homophily, if I uh, again take a step back and uh, look at how diffusion works on grids, right, on images. So if I take uh, this uh, face of uh, Sir Isaac and I run the diffusion equation on it, so I actually can give it a closed form expression. So I can express it as convolution with the Gaussian filter where the, the variance of the Gaussian will be growing with time, right? And what is important here is that the kernel of this, uh, this uh, process of this equation is the same everywhere, right? So I I spread the information in the same way at every point. And you see, of course, that this is undesirable, right? Because if the input image is noisy, I average out the noise, but I also destroy the discontinuities in the image. So, uh, and the idea uh, in the 90s was to uh, do um, a nonlinear diffusion that doesn't assume this kind of homophily, right? So I can choose at every point the speed of uh, diffusion. So this is what we call uh, non-homogeneous diffusion. So every position is uh, is uh, 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 has its own uh, speed of diffusion. And uh, actually, under a, a mistaken title of anisotropic diffusion, anisotropic means that it's also direction dependent. This idea was introduced by Pietro Perona and Jitendra Malik. And it was there was a flourishing literature of uh, PDE-based uh, image processing techniques. So in this case, we can choose the diffusion coefficient to be inversely proportional to the to the norm of the gradient. And what it will do, it will stop the diffusion when it crosses to uh, colors of different intensity, right? So it will not average apples and oranges. It will not average uh, uh, bright and dark regions in this in this example, right? So it will look, it will be a nonlinear filter and you see that it has this kind of bilateral structure. And uh, we can do the same thing on a graph. We can do the same thing on a graph. So maybe just some of these historical parentheses, uh, why all these uh, methods have disappeared uh, because it's mathematically a very appealing idea that you can start with an energy, right, that tells you how your ideal image should look like, and then you derive a differential equation as a gradient flow of this energy, and you you evolve the image under this uh, under this gradient flow, and uh, it gives you a better image, right, with less noise, maybe with uh, with sharpened edges. Uh, why this disappeared with the advent of deep learning? Because it's very hard to tell a priori uh, how a good image should look like, right, and. Uh, these are very, help, uh, very healthy and very helpful ideas because if you look at this, this is attention, right? So the idea that your uh, your neighbors interact with uh, with different degree of uh, uh, with different weight, right? Depending on how similar they are, that's exactly what is done here, right? The only thing is that it's not learnable. So we can revisit these ideas that, that uh, probably some of them are older than that some of the people sitting in this uh, in this audience. Uh, uh, in a new light, so we can apply them to graphs and we can apply them uh, in the context of uh, deep learning using uh, 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 using uh, backpropagation. So in this case, we'll have a learnable diffusivity function, right? So it can be implemented as an attention. And if I discretize this differential equation, you will see that we get the, the attentional uh, type of uh, graph network architectures, what we call GUTs, right? So you can see that, that classical architectures can be derived from, uh, uh, from the same uh, physical model and we can also maybe provide some theoretical guarantees on the way. Now, so far, I promised you that um, we wanted to see continuous version of graph neural networks, but so far, the only thing that was continuous is time, right? So we placed discrete layers by continuous time variable. And if again, we look at how diffusion is discretized uh, in the plane, right, on a grid, then uh, when we discretize uh, our Laplacian operator, we have many ways of doing it, right? So all these are valid uh, numerical stencils for the, the second order derivative, and so is the linear combination, right? So um, we want something like this. So we want not to be limited uh, a priori, as we've seen, to a particular graph, right? Because that's the computational graph that we have in this, in this uh, discrete uh, diffusion equation. And uh, an idea that, that will help us to do it uh, comes also from the domain of uh, image processing. And instead of considering this nonlinear adaptive diffusion equation, we can consider a non-Euclidean diffusion equation. And in non-Euclidean diffusion equation, we can think of an image as a, a manifold that is embedded in a joint space that contains positional coordinates of the pixels and their colors, right? So an RGB image would be 
a two-dimensional surface in uh, R5, right, in five-dimensional space, that uh, every pixel has X, Y coordinates plus R, G, and B channels, right? And by virtue of this embedding, we, we can define a special metric on this manifold that is called the pullback metric. And we can define also uh, a generalization of the Laplace and that is called the Laplace Beltrami operator that is associated with it. And we can write this non-Euclidean diffusion equation. We call it the Beltrami flow and it happens to be a gradient flow of a generalization of the Dirichlet energy to non-Euclidean domains that is called the Polyakov functional. And it's used in, uh, in particle physics and string theory uh, for in ways that I don't really understand. But um, maybe some people in the audience do understand. Uh, but uh, the, the, basically the, the punch punchline of this story, we can do the same thing on graphs. And as you know, in graphs, it's very common to uh, provide some positional coordinates uh, with every node. So we have the feature coordinates and the positional coordinates. We can evolve them together in a coupled way. And the evolution of the feature, uh, uh, of the feature component is the, the usual diffusion that we see on graphs. But the evolution of the positional component is some form of graph rewiring because we can bring nodes together and if there is no edge between them, we can introduce it to facilitate the flow of information. And this is how it might look like. So this is an example of this Beltrami flow on the graph. So here the colors represent some low dimensional projection of the features. The positions are again, some toy positional encoding. And you see that here we are trying to, to, to um, classify the nodes. So there are seven possible uh, classes of nodes. And you see that, uh, here, the, 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 the features are changing, right? So we are diffusing them. The positional coordinates are changing, and the graph is also changing on the fly, right? So we are rewiring. And uh, if you are coming from classical harmonic analysis uh, background, it sounds like a very uh, disturbing picture, right? Because you are applying a filter on a domain, but the filter, the, the domain is moving under your feet, right? So it's kind of a kind of uh, shaky ground. But uh, this is actually a very common uh, uh, situation in differential geometry where Differential geometers like to take their domains, right? Their manifolds and subject them to some uh, kind of evolution, right? Evolution equation that might look like uh, a diffusion equation. This is called uh, the Ricci flow. So uh, you take your Riemannian metric, right? That locally measures distances and uh, you evolve it in a way that is proportional to the to the curvature tensor, the, the Ricci, Ricci curvature. So uh, this is an example of uh, a dumbbell shaped uh, surface manifold. It has positive curvature here in the red parts and it has negative curvature in, the, in the, this bottleneck. And if I apply this equation, it looks uh, structurally very similar to the diffusion equation, right? We have temporal derivative of something on the left and we have second order derivative similar to the Laplacian on the right. But the, 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 what it does uh, to, to this object is very different from diffusion. Uh, this kind of dumbbell will become uh, more like an ellipsoid and then it will become more like a sphere and then it will collapse into a point. And these uh, Ricci flows were introduced by Richard Hamilton in the 80s with one objective, to prove the long-standing conjecture in topology that is called the Poincaré conjecture that claimed that you can characterize this way uh, higher dimensional spheres. And uh, if you think of the two-dimensional sphere, topological sphere, right, meaning that I can take a sphere and deform it in any crazy way, I can take a closed curve and collapse it into a point, right? I cannot do it on a torus. So if I have uh, a curve on a torus, right? So think of a torus like this. So this curve, right, my watch, I cannot collapse it into a point. And uh, as you probably know, it was proven exactly using these techniques by uh, Grigory Perelman. And uh, topologists were shocked that a differential geometer proved the holy grail problem. And uh, uh, what does it have to do with graph neural networks? So we mentioned this problem of uh, a failure of message passing to propagate information efficiently on the graph, what is called uh, bottlenecks or overscoring, And it happens uh, when two things coincide. When we have a graph that happens to be unlucky in the sense that the number of the neighbors of the neighbors increases uh, exponentially fast. So we are talking about exponential volume growth. And also our task requires to bring information from distant nodes. So we have long range interactions, right? And these are completely unrelated things, right? Because we might have different tasks on the same graph and the structure of the graph might affect the, the outcome in a different way in these situations. But assuming that we have some message passing neural network with a certain number of layers, bounded weights uh, and uh, Lipschitz activation functions, the way that we can characterize this over squashing is some kind of insensitivity, right? So I'm looking at the output of this multi-layer neural network at node i, and I see how uh, the change in the input in some distant node j uh, propagates to this output, right? And if it, if I perturb my node J and the output at node I is unaffected, then we have uh, a problem because uh, the message is lost uh, as it goes uh, through the graph to the, towards this node. And we can 
measure this using the, the uh, partial derivative, right, or norm of the Jacobian of the output with respect to the input. And the main result of, of, uh, of our paper is we can bound this Jacobian by some constants that depend both on the model, on the, the GNN architecture, as well as the structure of the graph, right? And it's interesting because I can choose, so this will tell me uh, what kind of graph neural network I want to choose, right? So it can tell me that, for example, I need to add maybe more layers, or maybe I can add more neurons, uh, maybe I can uh, change uh, my activation functions, but this is something that I typically cannot change, right? So this is the graph, this is what is provided as input, right? Or at least I would like to have some intuition on uh, how this, uh, this thing affects uh, my, my, my results. And intuitively you expect that something as benign as agreed where the volume doesn't grow that fast would probably not have a problem of over squashing, but something as bad as a tree where the, the number of uh, nodes, right? As we go deeper into the, the levels in the tree will grow exponentially. And uh, we don't really see it, right? So the topology of the graph here comes as the power of some modified adjacency matrix. It's not clear how uh, 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 how uh, the, the, the structure of the graph affects it. So we need some more nuanced ana analogy uh, or more nuanced uh, local analysis. And that's exactly where curvature comes into the picture. And uh, I remind you that what we call curvature and differential geometry can be defined in different ways. But one way of defining it is what is called geodesic dispersion. So I take two points on the manifold, I shoot geodesics in parallel uh, from them, and then I see whether they converge, uh, remain parallel, or diverge, right? And we, uh, if they converge, we are talking about something that looks like a sphere. Uh, if they remain parallel, then we are flat. It's Euclidean geometry. And if they diverge, then it's hyperbolic surface. And we can define something like this on a graph. So we can look at uh, uh, edges that emanate between uh, from uh, two connected nodes, denote them by P and Q. And if they form triangles, then uh, we have something similar to geodesic convergence. If they form rectangles, then we have something that looks like uh, uh, remaining parallel, right? So these are grid structures. And if they drift apart, then we have the analogy of hyperbolic uh, points, and uh, these are trees, right? So bottom line, we can design a combinatorial quantity that for every edge in the graph looks at some surrounding subgraph and count certain structures, certain types of rectangles and triangles, and uh, puts it into a single number that is called uh, uh, discrete Ricci curvature, so there are several ways of, uh, of defining it. We use our own definition, doesn't really matter. So what we can show is we can relate this curvature to the bound on this Jacobian, right, that measures over squashing. And informally, we can say that uh, the presence of strongly negatively curved edges uh, contributes to over squashing. And once we do it, we can apply something similar, at least philosophically, to this uh, Ricci flow, so we can cut out negatively curved edges and uh, they increase the curvature of the graph so they, they, it will become better connected and we show that it improves the performance of graph neural networks in both homophilic and heterophilic settings. Now all this story is nice and it's cool differential geometry right and discrete analogies of uh, of differential geometric constructions on graphs but one thing is missing uh, blatantly and this is uh, no relation to the task right so so far we I told you how the architecture of the graph neural network and the and the structure of the graph interact. But we don't have uh, the task, right? And this is a good example maybe to show it on the molecule that I can give you a graph that describes a molecule, right? And the molecules, we have different types of interactions. We might have interactions uh, of electrostatic forces, right? So colonic interactions that decay as one over radius. So they have long range effect, right? And uh, we have very short lived interactions uh, like Van der Waals interactions that affect uh, a tiny neighborhood of, uh, of every atom. And if I were to compute these kind of functions on, on my graph using the, the, the input graph, maybe input graph is good enough because everything is local. But in the second case, maybe I will need to account for all the atoms in the molecule, right? So I will need to uh, introduce new edges to, to, to do it efficiently. And you can see this is an example of same graph, uh, same features, uh, different task. And whether the graph is good uh, or not for this task, it depends on the task, right? So this kind of usual answers, is it good or not? It depends, right? So let's see how it, it depends. And that's, this will lead us to a new notion of uh, expressive power for graph neural networks. So first of all, what do we mean by task? So that will be a function that takes as input the graph and features on the nodes of the graph. And the interaction between uh, features and nodes i and j, we can describe it by second order derivative, right? Mixed derivative of what is called the Hessian. And we call it the mixing of the function, right? And we can see in the extreme case when uh, we can write this f as a function of individual features. Uh, phi here is some nonlinearity. In this case, it's fully separable, right? So second order derivative here is zero. 
So mixing is zero, meaning that I don't need to use the graph at all, right? So every node acts on its own. The, the other extreme case is where we have uh, everything mixed through some uh, nonlinear transformation of inner products of the features. And in this case, uh, the mixing will depend on how nonlinear this function phi is. So what we can do, we can bound the mixing by parameters that depend on the model and on the graph. And this brings together uh, all the three notions in the single inequality. And it allows us to talk about the capacity of MPNNs for a required task. So the capacity is measured uh, through the parameters of the model and the topology of the graph. And the mixing uh, describes the task, right? So it's not the only way of doing it, but it's a way of doing it. And we can show different bounds. So we can show, for example, bounds on the weights of the neural network, or maybe more interesting bounds on the depth. So I can tell uh, that the number of layers should be bigger than some constants that depend on the mixing, depend on the structure of the graph, and depend on the architecture. And uh, we can say, for example, that depth must be proportionate to the commute time. And rewiring algorithms uh, like Ricci flow or other ways that, that have been proposed in the literature, you can show actually that they try to improve the commute time or the reachability by, by a random walk of different, different nodes in the graph. And uh, because the tau commute time can be as large as uh, the, the cube of the number of nodes, uh, we can get impossibility statements. So basically, we forego completely the, the Weisfeld and Lemon duo, and we can express uh, the expressive power in uh, the form of these statements that an MPNN with a certain number of layers cannot learn tasks that require high mixing among nodes uh, that are separated by large commute time. Right. So basically, this gives us two things. So we can tell whether a given architecture can express certain functions or not, but it can also tell us how to modify the graph to improve uh, the, 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 the mixing that, uh, that this neural network can, can implement. So in the remaining few minutes, uh, let me say uh, again, uh, take you back to this uh, mental picture of a dynamic system, right? And we've seen that uh, we can define by choosing the, the uh, the the flavor of the GNN, right? The architecture, whether it's convolutional, attentional, or maybe more general message passing, is what kind of information is sent uh, between nodes, right? We also, by graph rewiring, we can determine where this information is sent, right? So uh, whether we are using my direct neighbors, or maybe I drop some of the neighbors, or maybe I create new connections or cut some of the connections. But again, everything is dynamic, right? So what is missing is some notion of time. So we need also to discuss uh, when to send this information. So I want to introduce the right feature, right, or the right piece of information at the right time. And if you look at classical and PNN, right, and compare it to transformers where the graph is fully connected, so let's say I need to send information from the red node to the green node, right? So you see that it, it has a three hop distance, uh, so it will require three iterations of diffusion or three layers of graph neural network. So first information is propagated to this neighbor, then to these two neighbors, and then finally it gets to uh, to, know, to the green node. And while it has reached the green node, it's already entangled with information from the other nodes, right? So I never get this pure message that is sent from red to green. It's always mixed with uh, everything else. In transformers, on the other hand, uh, the information is immediately available, but it might be too much stuff, right? So all the information is available. Every node can send information to every other node. So you can get uh, very quickly overwhelmed. And of course, we are not even talking about the computational complexity. So it scales quadratically with the number of nodes. So it might be too much if the graph is, uh, uh, the, the, graph is uh, uh, the graph is large. So what we can do is introduce what we call dynamic rewiring and we can present uh, this pure information from the node at the right time. So the, it, would take, uh, uh, it will take two iterations to reach this, this neighbor. So I will introduce the information from the red node, uh, not immediately like in transformer, but I will delay this information until the right moment when uh, it would have reached uh, th that, that information. And we can, also, uh, we can also do it in a different way. So I can uh, uh, implement it in the form of this uh, geometric uh, sparse skip connections. So the, the information reaches the right node at the right time and not entangled with uh, with the information from the neighbors. And um, this is a paper that appeared at uh, ICML last year and we're used to be state of the art on this new long range interaction uh, benchmark. Uh, I think not anymore. So what wins now is some kind of gigantic pre-trained model that, that puts a lot of graphs together and it works unsurprisingly better. But I think at least this is uh, uh, better geometrically motivated approach that, that there is still value in not only beating a benchmark by, by some epsilon margin, but, but also understanding uh, why uh, it happens and uh, why it is working. Uh, 
So the last thing I wanted to, to mention is a recent work that we call cooperative message passing. And if you look at the standard message passing uh, graph neural networks, every node uh, both listens to its neighbors and uh, and uh, uh, also broadcasts information to its neighbors, right? And it is also maybe too much, right? Because for some tasks, it might be that I need initially to send information from a node, but then this node becomes irrelevant, right? So it sent its information. The more has done, done his, his deed now, the more can go, right? I think it was Schiller who said it. But um, Basically, the node can shut up and not not talk anymore, right? So, in standard message passing, this is not possible, right? And there is also another important aspect that they allow me not to, to to go into it. But basically, in graph neural networks, uh, the nodes must wait for all the messages to arrive, right? So it must be synchronous. And in some situations, if this graph has a physical implementation, uh, it might take more time for uh, some information to travel, right? So some nodes might be geographically, for example, more distant, right? Or they might sit in different uh, portions of the memory of a GPU, right? If the graph is large and doesn't fit into memory. So long long story short, we want to introduce some uh, synchronicity. And this is possible by uh, what we call cooperative message passing. So every node can decide at every layer of the network whether it chooses to, uh, to broadcast and listen, only to listen, only to broadcast or to isolate, right? Like these uh, four wise monkeys. This was, image was actually produced by Dali, and it was incredibly difficult to do it <laughs> because uh, diffusion models don't generalize well, and uh, you can get all the versions of the, the, the typical monkeys right with uh, with their poses, but to have a combination of the poses like this was virtually impossible. So, so it was actually my student who managed to do it. I, I failed. So we are. I think we are not uh, being taken over by AI yet. At least and, 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 uh, until we sorted out the monkeys. And then maybe we can all die peacefully. And uh, basically, this, uh, you can think of it as some form of dynamic rewiring, right? So the, the, the computational graph becomes directional now. And we can also turn on and off some of the edges. Uh, and this is done so the, the decision of whether to, whether to, to uh, propagate, uh, to basically to listen to, 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 uh, to broadcast or to do both or to do no, none uh, is done, decided by a separate network. We call it the action network, and uh, it is interesting that uh, the, this is a stochastic algorithm because we sample from the distribution of actions, and by virtue of this, it is also more expressive than WL. So what we lose is permutation equivariance; it holds only an expectation, like with methods that, that attach uh, random features to, to the nodes of the graph. So um, I think it's about time for me to finish. So um, uh, I think with these physics-inspired approaches, we gain uh, an interesting, in my opinion new perspective on old problems like over smoothing bottlenecks uh, over squashing so i didn't talk about all of these but we we have results for for different flavors and different aspects of problems that that uh, graph neural networks typically experience we can explain formally old architectures we can also derive new ones for example by different considering different models different uh, differential equations or different uh, numerical discretizations of these equations we can make principled architectural choices right message passing is a very generic concept uh, or even convolutional architectures are very generic. So how exactly we choose the weights uh, is very important. And we can provide theoretical guarantees to expressive power, to stability, to convergence. I didn't talk about it, but we can also do all sorts of, even remaining within the, 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 the class of diffusion equations, we can do, for example, diffusion equations on uh, topological objects that are called uh, cellular shifts. So instead of, uh, for example, computing the gradient just as the difference between Two nodes, we can do the same way as we do on manifolds to do some sort of parallel transport. So my neighbor node, before I subtract it from myself, I first transform with uh, some uh, uh, some group, for example, rotations, uh, uh, the, the, uh, this feature vector, and only then I subtract. So it works like parallel transport on manifolds. And we can show that actually it is much richer diffusion. And uh, it also allows us to describe what kind of tasks can be performed for different choices of these of these groups. So it's another way of characterizing expressive power. Now, um, we've seen also that, that the graph in GNNs, it has this kind of dual role of both being part of the input and the computational device. And uh, it's not always wise to use the same graph for, for both purposes. And we can try to, uh, in a principled way, to, to change this graph, to do, to do graph rewiring. We can uh, look at it from the perspective of uh, some discrete anal uh, analogs of, of curvature, right? So using tools from differential geometry and also introducing the concept of time, right? So doing this propagation and uh, rewiring in, um, in a dynamic way. So I will probably stop here. Uh, thank you very much for coming and for your attention.